So uh, our last session is on immersion contaminants. Um, this is a program uh, that I think really highlights some of the more interesting, well, everything's interesting in the RMP, but some of the cutting edge um, uh, investigations into the unknown. So we're, we're looking for the, some of the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns in the, in the words of uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, I've been involved in uh, immersion contaminants uh, probably a year after the work group was formally formed uh, in 2006. So I joined uh, some of the efforts in 2007. I'm from uh, San Jose. I work at the Regional Wastewater Facility, and we've partnered with the RMP and other dischargers on a number of immersion contaminant sort, uh, studies. So we have a great um, set of speakers today. Um, going from, uh, so the RMP sort of takes this tiered approach and they do a mix of uh, focus studies on um, a, con a contaminant of emerging concern that is identified as high concern. And they also do some broad scale uh, screenings to look for those unknown unknowns. And then um, we try to wrap it all up into uh, what does it all mean and what can we do? And we've got talks that are focused on all of those. Our first speaker is on um, one of those focused uh, pollutant studies on PFAS. Um, and if you don't know what that is, Meg Sedlak, who is a program manager at SFEI, will explain that to you. Um, she's spent the last decade at SFEI on the water, in the mud, and hanging off of the Richmond Bridge to get one more sample of PFAS. And her favorite bit of unsolicited advice from field staff capturing seals was, stay away from the bitey end. Um, so I'm going to talk about a recently released report on fluorinated chemicals. Um, put the draft out. Um, okay, so sing, dance. Um, so I re 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 recently released that report, in, and um, we're having comments on it. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors who worked on that with me, um, Dr. Becky Sutton, Diana Lynn, um, and Adam Wong. And um, Phil asked me to just make a brief comment on something. So I, there are two things that I'm going to comment on before we jump into the report. First off, he uh, asked that I um, um, Figure it out. There we go. Okay. Um, Excuse these. Okay. Is it the down arrow? Okay. So he asked that I uh, talk a little bit about what happened. Uh, I'm doing fine, and I wish that I could say the injury was uh, fairly dramatic, that I'd been skiing, or that I'd taken up pro wrestling over the weekend, <laughs> or that I did like Evil Knievel kind of things. But the reality I was out on the trail and I tripped and I, I broke my collarbone. So I'm going to be in a sling for a while, but I'm totally fine. Um, I know that, Joe, you were interested in substituting people out, but it's really going to take a lot more to knock me off the podium than that. Um, I wanted to come back to what Karen talked about this morning uh, with regards to the RMP being a collaborative uh, group. And what I wanted to really impress upon you all about one of the amazing things about this program is that we're committed to doing the best science possible, and it's state of the art, and that's particularly true in the area of chemicals of emerging concern. And I wanted to give an example of the early years of one of the ways in which the program adopted novel techniques. So um, as many of you know, Russ Flagel is really, I mean, he's a, he's a giant in the field, like a giant sequoia. He's just done amazing science. And when the program got started, we embraced his techniques uh, wholeheartedly and implemented that. And similarly, um, we, when we jumped into the, the world of the perfluoro and polyfluorinated chemicals, um, we embraced a couple of the, the pioneers in that field. And at that point, that was um, Chris Higgins, who was getting his PhD at Stanford University, and Dr. Jennifer Fields, who was on sabbatical at Stanford. And they developed some of the uh, hone some of the methods for looking at perfluorinated, and they analyzed a couple of our uh, sediment samples for these compounds, and we published that in the Pulse in 2006. And then following up on that, um, 
The RMP was very instrumental in Erica House's PhD work. I'm working with BASMA, looking at, um, again, these same compounds, but again, really pushing the field forward in terms of developing an, an analytical method for looking at precursors, which has been, I mean, it's, it's a, that's been a game changer. So um, that was another example of how the program's been really helpful in this. Tom, that's your line. Go Bears. Um, <laughs> so Erica graduated, graduated with a PhD. She went on to uh, DTSC to work with Jun Su Park. And again, you know, uh, the program was really supportive of, of her, her work and the work at DTSC. Uh, BACWA helped to get effluent samples. And again, they sort of pushed the ball a little farther. And then similarly, our most recent paper that we just came out with this year that was working with uh, researchers from Stockholm University who uh, were working on new techniques, um, and then uh, Cal Academy. But none of this would be possible without you guys, um, you know, Bakla, Basma, and all of you in this room who really are committed to doing the best possible science and to really uh, doing these state-of-the-art uh, methods, which if you didn't do in the, in the field of chemical chemicals of emerging concern, we really wouldn't get any research done. So I really feel like round of applause. I would give you a round of applause right here. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to come back to what Karen was talking about this morning, how we have in, within the CEC world, uh, within the RMP, we've started to tier things in terms of classifications. And as you know, um, as Karen pointed out this morning, PFOX is in our top tier. So in the last decade or so, we spent a fair amount of time um, looking at these compounds. So the recent report that we uh, brought out synthesized the findings in the last uh, decade looking at a variety of matrices. It reviews the tiering to say, what have we learned? Can we move things in different tiers? Like we had moved uh, PPDs down tier based on I want to talk a little bit about nomenclature. Uh, I often wish that I worked on a more simple chemical like mercury, where there's one compound and maybe it gets methylated and maybe there are two. In this field, there are 3,000 of these compounds. So it really is uh, an alphabet soup. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, ways to decipher that. I'll mention some of the uses and then some of the concerns that we have about these compounds. So the poster children for this class of chemicals is really um, PFOS and PFOA. These are C8 compounds, meaning they have uh, eight carbons. They're perfluoro compounds, meaning that they're fully fluorinated, so each of the carbons have fluorines on them. So in the example of PFOA, it's perfluoroctanoic acid, so perfluoro meaning it's completely fluorinated, octa referring to the number of carbons. And then frequently at the end of these compounds, they will have uh, some sort of moiety that changes the, the um, the chemical properties of it. So it's generally C4 up to C14, but it can keep going. It's kind of like a chemist's dream because you can keep building and adding things to this. And we talk about things being uh, with uh, C8 above being long chain uh, compounds. There are certain compounds that we know uh, in this class that degrade to these terminal degradation pro products being the perfluoros, and we refer to those as precursors. I'll give an example here of a fluorotelomer alcohol, which we know degrades to PFOA. But again, you know, keep in mind you can have shorter chains or longer chains. And then as some of you may know, we're phasing out the C8 chemistry. As we phase it out, we're bringing in uh, shorter chain compounds like this perfluorobutane sulfonoic acid. So again, it's a C4. Um, and we refer to that as a, as a short chain um, perfluoro. And then this is where it gets sort of fun and interesting and sort of accounts for, well, I should mention that basically RMP has been focused on 13. Um, there's about 3,000 of these compounds in um, commerce. And uh, one of the areas of the 2,983 compounds are, are, are 87 compounds or things like this where they're just kind of, you know, various branchings and an ether put in or a hydrogen or something else. Um, so they're, they're polyfluorinated uh, alkyl substances. Polyfluorinated alkyl refers to the fact that the compound isn't uh, fully fluorinated. It has like a hydrogen right next to that oxygen. So they have some, they, they, at the class, these compounds have some unique properties. The carbon-fluorine bond is really strong. It means that they tend to be chemically inert, thermally stable, excellent surfactants. They've been in use since the early 50s. Um, 
widely used pretty much in any industry that you can imagine. I've given a couple examples up here of um, uh, an aid for the polymer processing. They're used in um, metal plating as a mist suppression. The oil and gas industry is a surfactant. We have them in use in our homes um, because they're used for oil and water repellency. So they're in textiles, they're in furniture. Um, they're common in food packaging. Uh, there's a little uh, graphic down there about a paper that just came out showing uh, that they're frequently found in um, like bread wrappers and things like that. Um, so there are definitely uh, a lot of uses. And some of these uses are um, external, uh, meaning that uh, when I say external, I mean that they kind of provide or can potentially provide a direct conduit into the environment. And this is the crash that occurred in 2013. And it's an example of the firefighting foams that they use to suppress uh, petroleum fires. And in uh, this case, SFO actually does uh, contain what's released. But in many instances, these AFFFs are used. And they're not contained. And they pre present a direct conduit to the environment. They're also used as insecticides and then um, for exterior paints. But honestly, the list goes on and on. Why are we concerned about these compounds? Um, they're toxic. Uh, P3, PFOS, we know that they're carcinogenic. Um, they cause suppression of the immune system. They cause reproductive and developmental effects. For PFOS, we have a wealth of data, um, both human health and ecological, which is how we were able to classify PFOS in the bird eggs um, as a moderate concern chemical. PFOA, we have less uh, ecological data. It's more of a challenge. Uh, we have a wide body of human health data, though. Um, some of you may be familiar with the DuPont um, uh, Ken Moore's uh, manufacturing plant in Parkersburg, West Virginia, where it contaminated the local drinking water supply. So 70,000 people were affected by that. And um, out of that came a lawsuit where they set up a scientific panel to establish correlations between exposure and um, diseases. And they identified positive uh, correlation with eight diseases, um, starting with like uh, uh, testicular cancer, uh, kidney cancer, uh, thyroid diseases, um, and there are a number of others. Um, we believe that the long chain compounds have similar modes of actions as to um, PFOS and PFOA. And there's very little data on the short chain and the polyfluorinated. The perfluoros that I talked about earlier are resistant to degradation, so they hang around forever. Um, and we know that the longer chain compounds tend to accumulate. Um, there have been a variety of management actions that have been taken on uh, PFOS and PFOA. Within Europe, um, they've been classified under the REACH program. Um, PFOS has been regulated within the US. It was detected in the human blood supply in early 2000. And then uh, EPA worked with uh, 3M that manufactured that to phase out the, their uh, C8 chemistry. In 2006, the US EPA worked with the major manufacturers of PFOA to try and phase that uh, class of compounds out as well. And then, again, recently headlines in um, newspaper have mentioned the uh, EPA uh, drinking water advisory that's about seven parts per trillion um, for combined for PFOS and PFOA. And it's estimated about six million people are, are drinking water above that advisory level. And then lastly, PFOS and PFOA have been proposed under Prop 65 as a reproductive toxicant. But one of the big challenges with this class of compounds is not everybody's playing by the same rules. So a number of uh, countries are continuing to produce PFOA. Uh, this is an example of people who are not signatories to the PFOA stewardship agreement, including India, China, Russia. Um, and they're continuing to produce these compounds. So uh, frequently, what people see is that they're treated on um, articles, and the articles are brought into the US. So it's a bit of a challenge. Um, so coming back to the Bay Area, some of the work that we've done in the last uh, decade or so, uh, we've been monitoring bird eggs, seal, uh, sport fish, uh, sediment and water, looked at bivalves, and then we looked at some of the pathways by which these compounds may be coming into the Bay. Be able to do um, multiple uh, sampling events, so we're able to say something about trends, and that was uh, very helpful in terms of the seal data that Karen showed this morning, where she was showing a decline in the PFOS. Uh, 
And for most of these, we're looking at the standard list of about 13 analytes. But for a couple of them, um, some of the work that Eric Houts did and also some of the work that Jonathan Benskin did, we were able to look at an expanded list. So for this, this afternoon, I'm basically going to focus on our bird egg data, our seal data, and then talk real briefly about some of our wastewater and stormwater results. So um, looking at PFOS and bird eggs, we see that um, e the I put a graph here of the three sampling stations, Wheeler Island, Richmond Bridge, and South Bay. And you see there are four time periods that we looked at, 2006, 2009, 2012, 2016. And we see our highest concentrations down on the South Bay. And those first two bars um, were part of the reason why we had listed it as moderate concern. And uh, because it was above a, a, a PNAC, our predicted no effect concentration of about 1,000. But as we dive back into the literature, we see that the more recent sampling events are still above uh, a field study level that shows uh, impact to hatching success. So based on that, we're continuing to list uh, PFAS as moderate concern. Um, I would also like to note that, let me take this off, I feel like it's, I feel like it'd be easier if I just use a mic. Um, <laughs> Can I use my? Okay. Um, so um, we, we've been monitoring sport fish for these compounds, and we see in the South Bay um, concentrations of uh, PFOS that are above some state uh, sport fish guidelines for people who frequently eat fish. This is an example of uh, some of our data for PFO, which is one of C C8, and some of the other uh, long chain carboxylates in bird eggs. And, um, I've focused in on the South Bay, which is, as you saw from the previous graphic, uh, one of the areas that we have the highest um, concentrations. Um, but it's, it's emblematic of what we're seeing across the bay. And again, I have the four years of sampling. And there are sort of three take-home messages I'd like you to take away from this graph. First of which is the uh, axes are about an order of magnitude lower. So PFOS is by far the dominant thing that we see in biota. Um, and it's usually order of magnitude higher than the other uh, compounds that we see. Second is that we basically start this at, at C8, and we, we're not seeing compounds less than C8. We see um, compounds that are, are greater than C8. And again, that's consistent with the literature, which basically says the short chains don't bioaccumulate. And then the third that I'd like you to note is that basically there's no consistent trend. And you can kind of see that from looking at the total at the end of the graph there, where it just, you know, the numbers kind of go up and down. So if we switch over to seals, Karin did me the favor of already showing the PFOS graph, so I don't need to include that. But if we jump over to PFOA, um, it's a similar story as, as we look in the South Bay. Again, uh, the concentrations are about an order of magnitude lower. We don't see the C7s and below, and there's not a statistically significant uh, decline. So as a result, we're making the recommendation that we list PFO in the long chains uh, up in the, the moderate concern class. And then uh, for the short chains, we're recommending them as listing them as possible concerns. And the short chains, as, as I mentioned before, we don't see them in biota. We are seeing them in stormwater and wastewater. But we really can't classify them because, as I mentioned before, we have virtually no tox data to compare to to, to, to make any, uh, any sort of inferences about the risk level. Um, the rationale for including the long chains is that they're widely detected in the seals and birds and then some of the sport fish. We don't see an evidence of decline. Um, we know that these are compounds that don't degrade. And in the one study that does exist for seals, the, the levels that um, cause an effect are similar to the levels that we see in our seals in San Francisco Bay. We also looked a little bit at the human health data uh, for these long chains and the concentrations that we see in humans that can cause effects uh, like adverse uh, birth outcomes like reduced birth weight and uh, reduced head circumference. It's an indication of uh, brain development are comparable to the concentrations that we're seeing in the bay. Right there? No. Um, so I'm just moving to the third chapter, which is our recommended monitoring strategy for the uh, regional monitoring program. So for status and trends, we're recommending that we continue on with the, the bird egg monitoring to assure the, the declines that we're seeing in PFAS. We're recommending that we continue the sport fish monitoring that we're doing every five years. Um, we added one site um, 
uh, last year. And um, it, Artesian Flu, which is one of the southernmost sites, and I put an example here of their concentrations in the bay and Artesian Flu, and you can see that they're, they're somewhat higher. So we're recommending to include that site, and we're recommending that we do the standard analyte list. Um, we're recommending a, a two special studies, one on sediment and seals, um, which would uh, continue to confirm the trend that we see in PFOS. Um, it would also be uh, monitoring in the margin sites um, as still, and as you heard earlier today, the margin sites is an area of a, of a lot of action, both in terms of contaminants and also in terms of uh, importance to biological organisms. And then here we're recommending that we would use some advanced techniques, um, some of uh, Eric Hauts' methods of looking at precursors and degradation of precursors, as well as non-targeted analysis, and Jennifer will be talking a little bit more about that this afternoon. But, you know, essentially when we only look for 13, it's kind of like having a low beam and you get pretty good uh, uh, visual, uh, a pretty good uh, idea of what's going on. We would um, basically be using something that kind of has a high beam and lets us see a little farther down the road uh, of the types of things that might be out there. And then um, we're recommending stormwater monitoring. I put a real quick graph here of our effluent work. Um, the C8s are reducing and the C4s and C6s the alternatives are um, increasing, we'd like to come back and look at stormwater to do repeats there to see whether we're seeing a similar product shift in that. Um, and that's, uh, again, something that we'd like to use the advanced techniques that I mentioned before. So the draft report has been out. I've gotten comments back from a number of you. I really appreciate the input, and we're expecting the final report out. And I think I have no time for questions, so sorry. <laughs> We'll have a panel at the end of this, so you'll be able to ask Meg your questions um, at that point. So um, moving along, um, we're going from the uh, more targeted uh, pollutant-specific monitoring into a non-targeted um, analysis. Um, Jennifer Sun will be talking um, about some of those efforts. Jennifer is an environmental analyst at SFEI, and she works on projects related to contaminants in bay fish and monitoring of emerging contaminants. Some of her work has included selenium impacts to sturgeon, um, looking at pesticides, looking at pharmaceuticals, um, and the thousands of contaminants that can be uh, identified through non-targeted analysis. Everyone hear me? This? Okay. Uh, cool. So as Eric talked about and Meg mentioned, um, I'll be talking with this presentation about um, how we're identifying those known unknowns, but also those unknown unknowns. So we've been talking a lot about adaptation and how we're using the program to make sure that we're addressing the latest challenges and using the latest scientific information. And one of the ways that we do that through our CEC program is using these kinds of non-targeted analysis. Um, so I'll be specifically uh, presenting data from a study that we've done with one of our great emerging contaminant work group advisors, Lee Ferguson, who's at Duke University. Um, we did this study with him last year looking at contaminants in ambient bay water and wastewater using these non-targeted analyses. So I'll be presenting some results from that study and then talking a little bit more broadly about uh, what non-targeted analysis is and how we're using it to complement our targeted analysis and to help us find what we've been missing. So, okay. So first we'll start off with the basics of what is non-targeted analysis. So for comparison, we can start off thinking about what targeted analysis is, which is right where we're going out with a specific defined list of contaminants that we're looking for based on our preconceived notions of what's likely to be out there and what's likely to be toxic to our environment, um, and then looking very specifically for those compounds. So um, sort of adding on to Meg's analogy earlier, uh, targeted monitoring is sort of like looking for something with a flashlight, where the light is really bright, so when we see something, we're definitely sure what it is, but the view is pretty narrow, so we're only looking at a couple or a small number of compounds at a time. Whereas uh, non-targeted analysis is more like looking for something with a lantern, where the light is more dim, but it's cast much more bright, widely. Uh, so the light is more dim, meaning when we identify compounds, 
uh, the identification may be more tentative, and we don't get full quantitative information. So we don't get concentrations, although we can get an idea of relative abundance. Uh, but the benefit of non-targeted analysis is that it allows us to take a much broader view, an unbiased view of what contaminants are likely to be out in our environment, which can then help guide where we want to take a closer look with our flashlight. So uh, as Karin mentioned earlier, one of the challenges of monitoring and CEC monitoring is prioritizing among the thousands and thousands of chemicals that are out there to determine what are those few compounds that we should target um, for extensive monitoring based on those that we think are likely to be most affecting our Bay ecosystem. And non-targeted analysis helps us with this prioritization by at least narrowing our view to those compounds that we know or that we suspect are in our environment. So in our samples, we found on the range of about three to 5,000 compounds per sample, which is still a lot of compounds, but it's much narrower than you know, the hundred thousands of compounds that we could conceivably be considering. Um, and then periodic non-targeted monitoring is also recommended as part of our CEC strategy as one way to keep ahead of the new chemicals that are constantly coming out and the new scientific information that's coming out about those compounds to make sure that our targeted monitoring is staying as up-to-date as possible. Okay, so over the past two years, we've been conducting a series of non-targeted analyses to help us get a first baseline look at what kinds of compounds we might be missing with our targeted analyses. So back in 2015, we completed this first study looking at muscle tissue and harbor seal blubber. Um, and that study found that our targeted analysis of wildlife tissue was actually doing a pretty good job of covering the major contaminant classes of concern that we identified with the non-targeted analysis. Um, we also identified a small number of additional compounds that we otherwise had not been looking for. And one of those compounds, methyltriclosan, we are now doing a targeted study for um, looking in prey fish. So that gives you a couple of examples of how we are using our non-targeted data to evaluate and update our targeted monitoring strategy. Uh, and then last year, we conducted this study uh, looking at ambient bay water and wastewater. Uh, and then just this past year, we collected sediment samples from the margins areas of South Bay and Lower South Bay, um, and we'll analyze those along with some ambient sediment um, using non-targeted analyses as well. Uh, but today, I will be focusing on these water data. So for this study, we collected ambient bay water samples from three locations that are influenced by different contaminant pathways. So we had one site on the Napa River, which receives agricultural runoff. We had one site in San Leandro Bay, which is influenced by urban runoff. And then we had one site on Coyote Creek, which is influenced by wastewater effluent. So at each of these three sites, we deployed a passive sampler for about a month. And then we collected grab samples before and after the deployment of that passive sampler. Um, and then we also collected 24-hour composite samples of final effluent from four wastewater treatment plants, including secondary and tertiary treatment plants in, in North, Central, and South Bay. So we collected all of these samples, we sent them off to Duke, and our analytical partners at Duke ran the samples through uh, an ultra-high performance liquid chromatography system coupled to an Orbitrap Fusion Lumos mass spec. So this, yes, so the Fusion Lumos mass spec is really the latest and greatest in mass spec technology. This is actually a new instrument that just came out that um, our partners at Duke purchased a few months ago. And they originally had run our samples on an earlier version of this instrument. And they're currently in the process of rerunning all of our samples on this new, much higher resolution instrument, which basically means we'll be able to get better data to make more and more confident chemical identifications. So this is really a great benefit that we're getting through our partnership with um, Duke and being able to get this higher quality data. And again, really highlights one of the benefits of our CEC program, which is our collaborations and our ability to take advantage of some of these um, pro bono efforts. OK, so our partners of Duke have run or will run our samples through this mass spec instrument. Um, and then the next step after that is taking that data and turning that into chemical identification. So broadly, the general way that we do this is by trying to 
match data that we have for our compounds to data that's out in the scientific literature describing various known environmental compounds. So depending on the resolution of data that we have for our compounds and the amount of information that's out in the scientific literature for various environmental compounds, we may only be able to identify compounds to varying levels of certainty. So ideally, we're making identifications based off a compound's MSMS spectra. So every chemical can be described by a mass spectrum or a series of mass spectra that basically describe the chemical structure. So this is an example of a mass spectrum for one of the compounds in our sample. Um, you can see basically the little annotated peaks each represent a different fragment of that chemical structure. So this particular mass spectrum can be considered like a unique fingerprint ID for that particular compound. So once we have all these fingerprints, chemical identification really becomes like fingerprint matching. So in an ideal case, we'll be able to find a good fingerprint match between our compounds and fingerprints that are well described out in a spectral library database. And when we can find a good match in a spectral library database, we would consider that a high confidence chemical identification. And so in the spectral library databases, we have on the range of several thousand to maybe 20 or 30,000 compounds per database. And you know, that's a vast improvement over what we can typically find using targeted analyses. Um, but you know, 20 to 30,000 30, compounds compared to the universe of compounds that could potentially be out there is still not that not that many compounds. So for a lot of those um, compounds in our samples, we can't find good spectral library matches. So in those cases, we need to turn to alternative identification methods using other sources of data. And this is really where the heavy lifting comes in. This is where the innovation of our uh, partners at Duke comes in, in being able to use these lower quality sources of data to identify compounds. So just to give you an example of one of these other methods, um, one method that they use is something called in silico fragmentation, which is where they take chemical structures that are described in the literature, and they run that through a computer program that can basically predict what a fingerprint would look like based on the chemical structure. So then we try to match the predicted fingerprint with our fingerprint ID. And so that allows us to make a lot more uh, identifications, although those, those identifications we would consider more tentative. Um, but we can still get a lot of valuable data from tentative identifications. So for example, we might find a lot of compounds that have um, a particular type of functional group. They might look like a particular type of transformation product. We might see a lot of a certain type of compound from a particular source or a particular use class, which might suggest that we want to do more monitoring of a particular type of chemical or, or a particular source area and then we can hone in on that further with targeted analysis. So to give you an idea of what our data structure looks like, this pie chart generally represents the universe of compounds that we found um, in our samples. So then across all of our samples, we detected on the range of about 5,000 compounds. And of those, only a very small sliver were identified using a limited targeted analysis that this group did. Um, so targeted analysis would be like the highest confidence type of identification we can make, but we can only do that with a very small number of compounds. So, you know, in comparison, we were able to make high confidence matches based on spectral library information for about 10% of our compounds. And then for another 50% of the compounds, um, we had MSMS spectral data, so we had fingerprint information with which we could make more tentative identifications. But then for another about 40% of the compounds, we didn't have fingerprint information at all, which is really a result of uh, the limitations of the instrumentation in being able to read data on so many compounds all at once. So then this is where the benefit of this um, fusion Lumos mass spec comes in, in that it will help us to produce more data so that we can kind of shrink that portion of the pie where we don't have fingerprint IDs to about 20% or less of the total compounds that um, we we detected. So that'll really improve the number of compounds that we'll be able to tip tentatively or, or with higher confidence identify um, that we'll be able to look through to try to, to guide our targeted monitoring. Okay, so now that I've, I've talked about what the structure of our data looks like, let me talk about some results. 
Uh, so one of the objectives of the study was to compare contaminant profiles across sites that are influenced by different contaminant pathways. So what did we find at each of these sites? Well, we can start off um, on Coyote Creek, which is located there in Lower South Bay. Um, we sampled this site during the dry season, so when this site proportionally sees the greatest influence from wastewater effluent. And now historically, a lot of our CEC monitoring has focused on uh, wastewater effluent and wastewater effluent influenced areas because we expect a lot of these synthetic compounds to be present in consumer products and then likely to be um, come from residential sources. So you know, what we found at this Coyote Creek site was quite similar to what we were expecting from this kind of um, source area um, in that the contaminant profile looked kind of like diluted wastewater effluent. So we saw a lot of the same kinds of compounds that we saw in effluent, but generally just at lower abundances. So again, a lot of what we saw, as you might expect, are things like pharmaceuticals, personal care products, um, and in some cases, some pesticides that are used in residential settings. Um, and so this, this actually indicated to us that our targeted monitoring of uh, wastewater effluent and effluent influenced areas is doing a pretty good job of covering these contaminant classes. So for example, we have some ongoing studies looking at pharmaceuticals in wastewater effluent in a study um, in collaboration with some Bothell partners. And we also collected some sediment samples from, again, the margins areas of South Bay and Lower South Bay that we will analyze for pesticides, fragrances, and some other personal care products. So in the next couple of years, we'll be able to get a lot of good data that will um, highlight to us uh, which specifically of these key compounds may be of concern. In comparison, we've done less monitoring of agricultural runoff um, and areas influenced by agricultural runoff. Um, and what we found at our Napa River site was really that this, this was our least contaminated site, as we might have expected. Um, a lot of what we saw at this site were pesticides and complex compounds that looked like possibly plant breakdown products. So again, compounds that we might expect from areas influenced by agricultural runoff. Um, we didn't really find any unique compounds that were specific to this site that, that were highlighted as those that we might want to um, consider in the future at this point. But in comparison, uh, what was one of our more surprising findings and one of the most interesting findings from the study was that our San Leandro Bay site was actually our most contaminated site by far. Um, and this was interesting because, again, historically, a lot of our monitoring of CECs has focused on wastewater effluent, not enough. So at this site, we found over 1,000 compounds that were present at significantly elevated abundances compared to effluent itself, which indicated that we were clearly seeing another source for these compounds. And in particular, we found a couple of um, key compound groups that seemed to highlight specifically urban runoff um, sources. So this indicates, again, that we may want to do more monitoring, not only of compounds that may be present in urban runoff, but also that we may just want to be doing more CEC monitoring in urban runoff and urban runoff influenced areas as well. So some examples. Um, this compound, diphenylguanidine, was an interesting compound that we otherwise hadn't been aware of, um, but was one of the most abundant sites at our uh, San Leandro, one of the most abundant compounds at our San Leandro Bay site. So this compound is involved in the rubber vulcanization process, which means we we'll basically are likely to see it where we see a lot of rubber products. And where do we see a lot of rubber products? Well, in car tires, which are you know, very characteristic of urban areas. So this compound to us looks like a signal of urban runoff, indicating that that's, we're clearly seeing urban runoff at our San Leandro Bay site. Um, this particular compound is also slightly bioaccumulative and has a pretty low aquatic toxicity threshold. And that, combined with the fact that it was very abundant at San Leandro Bay, suggests that this particular compound may also be one of concern. Um, and then one other example is this group of compounds, nonalphenol ethoxylates, which some of you um, probably have heard us talk about. Um, it's currently uh, listed as a moderate concern chemical within our tiered risk framework. Uh, and this is because nonalphenol ethoxylates are really widely used in a variety of applications. They're persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. And the final breakdown product of uh, the ethoxylates, which is nonalphenol itself, um, is known to be an endocrine disruptor. So we have concerns about this chemical group, but we haven't been able to do a lot of targeted monitoring in the past. Um, 
monitoring of nonylphenol and the mono and di indicate that those are not present at level of concern, but we haven't done monitoring of the many longer chain ethoxylates, which could potentially be causing toxicity, um, particularly when in mixture with these other compounds. So we went looking in our non-targeted data to see if those compounds were present and whether that would warrant more targeted monitoring. Um, and we found that they were definitely present and that urban stormwater runoff seemed in particular to be a major source for these compounds entering the bay. Um, this plot shows the relative abundance of various monophenol ethoxylates and a related group, octophenol ethoxylates. So each of those bars represents basically a different chain link of an ethoxylated compound. So ranging from the shorter chain ethoxylates on the left to the longer chain ethoxylates on the right. Um, and you can see they're definitely present. They seem to be a bit more abundant at our San Leandro Bay site. Um, and that's particularly interesting because um, these compounds have been historically used in laundry detergents. So they've been very much associated with wastewater effluent. Um, but they're also widely used in um, uh, various outdoor and industrial settings, so like paints and coatings. Um, and our data seems to show us that these outdoor and industrial uses are, are seem to be a major source for these compounds entering the bay. So in part based on this data, we've again collected sediment samples from both uh, areas that are influenced by urban runoff and wastewater effluent, and we've archived those for further analysis of these compounds. So those are just a couple of examples of some key compounds that were highlighted to us um, based on the data that we saw. Um, and it kind of gives you an example of some different ways that we used non-targeted data to inform our targeted monitoring. Um, but of course, there were a lot of compounds that we detected. There's a lot more analysis for us to do. And again, all of our samples are being rerun. So we'll be doing a little bit more analysis in the next few months. Um, but a final fact sheet on this data will be out next spring. So look out for that. Um, and with that. Only out of time, so. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so we've heard about some targeted studies. We've heard about non-targeted studies, and um, our next speaker is going to uh, take even a, a further step back and give kind of an overview of what we've learned and how it's helped us and um, what it all means. So if I could get the speakers to come up front and um, if I could also ask Becky Sutton, who is the um, senior scientist on the, for the Emerging Contaminant Studies at the RMP to, to join them, we can open it up for questions. Uh, I found this order on the great pad legislation uh, interesting. Does uh, that apply to or affect uh, uh, foreign imported cars or imported brake pads? Absolutely. In the middle. This, this question again is for Kelly on the brake pad uh, copper reduction. So in the regulation itself, how is the safety of the alternatives defined and determined. It, 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 is it with the same endpoint as copper, or because there are there could be other matrices that that is affected by the alternative? So the um, the, the burden is on the manufacturer to do that screening, and uh, because it was ahead of the um, Safer Consumer Products Regulatory Program, we weren't able to define specific parameters to how it would be done. So it's basically a burden to do that and to be able to demonstrate it to the department if the department calls it in. So I, I and other scientists have actually been examining the ingredients that are being sold and used, and I'm extremely encouraged. So you know, we've received the phone calls about, is this okay, is that okay, am I not thinking about something here? Um, the auto industry is also driving this. Um, many industries have stewardship programs now for the chemicals that are in their products. The auto industry has a chemical use reporting system. They have every chemical that they know is either regulated or is a potential concern or future regulation, any other kind of environmental issue they've identified. They've got it on a huge database, and they require every supplier to list every the content of every one of those chemicals in, in that database before those products can be submitted to them for potential use. Uh, and they will reject certain things, so like lead, Unless it's in batteries, it's gone. You know, there's a whole series of things like that. 
And that's just one example. There's a lot of industries that are doing these kinds of initiatives and taking these kinds of programs a step beyond what's regulatorily required. It's really exciting. Thanks. Um, uh, listening to your presentation, uh, and you're talking about the really rigorous science that needs to be done, and I'm, I'm really impressed with all the work that, that you all have done. Obviously, it's, it's been amazing, um, but it seems like there, and what you said about the, um, the brake pad legislation, that the manufacturer has to come and provide that proof, it seems like there should be more room for precautionary principle. And I don't know if that's just human nature, that, that you're like, no, you have to prove to me that this product is going to kill people before I take it off the shelves, um, or this product is going to do harm before I take it off the shelves. When there's such a clear linkage, it seems like maybe we should be taking action or be able to take action sooner. Is there are there pathways for that, or is there a role to play? I mean, I would certainly allow the RMP's resources to go a lot further, and a lot of a lot of the science. I mean, it takes so much time to do this stuff. It just seems like there's some potential there. <laughs> I, I, this is, that's where things are headed. So I, I, in the old paradigm, it was, let's argue about each chemical. So consumer product regulation is changing. So it's starting to ask, is, is, that, is, is it necessary? Is it necessary to use this chemical? Is there a better alternative? Regulations are asking that, particularly the Safer Consumer Product Regula Regulatory Program is the lead in that. Uh, but manufacturers are starting to think that way too. Is it necessary for me to use this chemical that I'm not quite sure of? Isn't there a better alternative? That's where things are headed. So we're moving from that old paradigm, let's argue about each chemical, and we're moving towards the new paradigm where we're saying we're on a journey. It's a path <coughs> towards safer products. We aren't going to get there tomorrow. We don't know all the answers today. And it's a stepwise process, sometimes with multiple substitutions. But the idea is that the better science we have to inform decision making, so the screening of the chemicals, the better decisions the manufacturers are going to make, the better decisions the regulators can make, it's a journey that we are taking together towards this new world. <laughs> there we go. Go ahead, Steve. So, Jennifer, this is probably a question more for you than anybody. Um, uh, the, the work that you're doing on non-target analysis is nationally leading stuff, and uh, congratulations on it. Um, but have you started to identify some of the groups that you think may become the next targeted groups as we kind of move from flame retardants to, to PFAS? What, what, what do you see in, in the preliminary work as maybe the next group? Yes. So, point out that our, so our analytical partners at Duke are doing a lot of you know, doing this identification, and there's still a lot more um, to, to improve the those tentative identifications. But I think, like, the, the main grouping that was highlighted from this study that we hadn't otherwise been looking at were um, these like urban runoff specific types of compounds like that have a wide variety of uses of things that are associated with like cars and coatings and those kinds of things. So um, uh, there's yeah so, so there's a the group so that's sort of the general group of compounds I think will will have the most uh, have the most potential for us to, to need to look into farther. Um, but there's again more data that they'll have to analyze for us to look into further. So I think beyond that we'll have a little bit more maybe next year. Yeah. my name is Dan My name is Dan I used to work for the RMP and I started the uh, Contaminants of Emerging Concern program here. Uh, but just to answer your question when you're saying what's a good particular group, what, there are a lot of active ingredients out there and they're always going to constantly be changing. But what's important, and to get an active ingredient somewhere, you have to deliver it. So it's all these delivery mechanisms and transporters or these chemicals that are used to transport and solubilize and help things move into different matrices, those are the ones that we actually find. Your vulcanization reagents, your polyethoxylates, uh, you know, those are the ones that stick around for a long time. Your, uh, your plasticizers, you see they're, they're structural, but they, they help things move and they're transporters. So think about all these different mechanisms or these transport-like chemicals or uh, new products that are coming out to help things move, solubilize, mobilize. 
move between different matrices like blood and, and uh, uh, tissue or other tissues. You know. Okay, that's, that's, that's one answer. That's what I think is the way to be looking for for the next 25 years. As opposed to going after active ingredients, you know, we don't care about those. They disappear. They degrade real fast. Thanks for that perspective, Daniel. Um, actually, your, your initial question, Steve, made me um, think of a question that I wanted to ask the panel, and that's, um, you know, you guys are all involved in, uh, heavily involved in research on emerging contaminants, and that's not just a local effort. You've got to research and you've got to collaborate with outside folks. How does the sort of the state of our program and what we're looking at and the effort that we are, are um, putting forth in the RMP and in the Bay Area compare to what other folks are doing around the country or around the world? <laughs> I won't. Um, my name is Becky Sutton, if you don't know me. Uh, and I lead our emerging contaminants team right now. Thanks, thanks for setting it up for me. Uh, and Meg, too, of course. Uh, we are actually, at this point, world leaders in emerging contaminants, monitoring, and science. It's very cool. Uh, if, you came, if you come to our emerging contaminants work group meeting, you will see our international expert panel uh, just speaks glowingly. And these guys are experts, uh, academics mostly, top, top of the field. And they just tell us how much we are leading the way in terms of looking for new contaminants, doing, doing some And, and really providing the science that informs the management decisions. Because I like science just for science's sake, but that's not our role. We need to do the specific studies that will lead to the best decision making to protect water quality here. As in many environmental uh, kind of things in the Bay Area, the work we do here goes statewide, goes national, goes international. So it's great that we are here leading the way with, with our science and our monitoring. I'll add on and just say that there's one thing that's really excellent about this program is that it's looking forward instead of backwards. An awful lot of CECs programs are looking at the last generation of CECs and not the next generation of CECs. It's so typical to use the, it's the old, you know, the sign post, I'm looking for my keys where the light is and not looking all around. These aren't there. <laughs> and the chemicals change really quickly, and, and that's happening even more with all these new pressures that I talked about. And this program and Dr. Sutton and the team are really, I think, incredibly good at saying what's happening next, where are things going, really keeping their eyes on the ball, the literature, the pro consumer product information. And that's what makes this program really compelling. Um, I also think that taking that next step on the non-target analysis is absolutely crucial because we're getting into some of those questions of where, you know, where are things that nobody's even picked up and, and started looking? You know, what, what boulders has nobody even looked under before? And, and now we're going to get to look at a whole lot of those at once and start getting some indication about where things, you know, what kinds of chemicals and what kinds of chemical uses are connected with what's reaching San Francisco Bay. Uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, actually, probably 15, I got invited to work with the Pew Foundation on coastal management issues and particularly about monitoring. And I got pulled back to these wonderful places where I could go to art museums and talk to who's who in coastal management, the first head of Puget Sound Water Quality Authority and yada, yada, yada. And to a person, they were jealous of the Bay Area and the regional monitoring program. And I say that because I see Steve Ritchie up there. And... What a great idea. So this is a question for Kelly. Um, in terms of getting ahead of the curve, like um, um, you know, screening consumer products uh, even before they're formulated, that sort of thing. I remember back when pyrethroids were first kind of on the scene, and it took folks, Kathy Kriegel, I think, at USGS years and years and years to figure out how to measure those in the environment. So what about also asking uh, consumer product manufacturers to provide the methodology for measuring the chemicals that they're going to put in their products? 
That's a really great idea, and one of the authorities that both Department of Pesticide Regulation and DTSC have is to require chemical analysis methods to be provided. So uh, DPR, most of its decisions are pretty clear cut, uh, but there's some where it's a little closer, and they are now routinely using that authority to require the chemical analysis method. So if there's, a, they won't register a future pyrethroid, but if there's something that probably won't be a water pollutant, but they want to be able to track it really, really well, they require that chemical analysis method and it's validated and suitable for environmental media at the time of registration. That's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> We got one more. One more from Tom. Yeah, well, it's not a, quite a question. I just want to lodge what what these all are showing, what we've accomplished from the R and P, and if we if they've stimulated any interest, please uh, read the strategy. The strategy is is a living document. We're going to continuously improve upon it, but we've laid out a vision of of, of along the lines of what was described here today, touching on all these all the subject matter. So we're not just winging it. We have a well-founded con concept. And in the, but I also want to just restate, if it wasn't obvious, what uh, Kelly brought out. What happens in California, particularly in regards to pesticide regulation, does not happen anywhere else in the country. We, it's, a, it's, it's, you can think about the fact that, oh, I think only maybe three other states or two other states even take any kind of action. And it's everything is pretty much rubber stamp what, what happens federally. So we actually have a, a real Department of Pesticide Regulation that, that, that's being very serious about this in partnership with us. It's, it's delightful to see what's happened over the last 20 years, and particularly the last 10 years. And, and, and Kelly, we have a lot. We can thank you a lot for that as you've nurtured, <laughs> you've nurtured trust with them, and I think building off the trust that the R&P has nurtured in terms of joint fact-finding and not uh, jumping first head first into the regulatory uh, you know, bogmire, we get good information then to inform good decision making and, and uh, we're, we're reaping the benefits of that attitude you know, and it's, it's stretching now in other parts of the state. It's maybe a positive note to end on. That's a great note. <laughs> so, um,